any questions that you have for him, we will make appointments immediately upon him arriving, and we will have him call Probably. you. Or we uh, the report was uh, an attempt to focus on what some of the realities are about biofuels. Uh, as you all are aware, there's a considerable uh, amount of information in the press about the supposed benefits of biofuels, uh, but there's little information about what some of the real problems are. And we've attempted to uh, have a look at these and, and summarize them in this report. Uh, as you're aware, biofuels are being pushed as a, uh, an opportunity for the U.S. And, and many other developed countries that have high need for liquid fuels to uh, produce what appear to be very environmentally benign uh, sources of uh, energy for liquid transport. And the, uh, the recent uh, interest and concern that's been expressed uh, globally about climate change is, is also being addressed by uh, biofuels with the expectation that the use of biofuels will in fact reduce greenhouse gases. Um, <clears throat> there are, I think, uh, significant challenges to these assumptions, and these challenges are outlined uh, in the report. Uh, <clears throat> it is um, clear, I think, from the evidence, if one looks at all of the evidence, that there are some serious uh, problems with biofuels. And we focus the report on corn ethanol in particular. And also, I, I would like to emphasize that the report is really addressing large-scale industrial biofuels as opposed to local uh, use under certain conditions. So the report is really focusing on agricultural and uh, industrial uh, level large-scale biofuel use. And it's very important to keep that distinction in mind. But when we look at that, uh, we realize that there are some very serious problems. The first one is that the amount of energy that is actually provided by conversion of corn to ethanol as a liquid fuel is that, at very best, the net energy return from that conversion is uh, tiny compared to what we get from uh, petroleum products and gasoline. And in fact, some of the evidence suggests it may even be negative. And so in order to get uh, a minimum return at best, there would have to be a number of other enormous benefits to such a fuel. However, when we look at that evidence from the perspective of uh, greenhouse gas emissions and their impact on climate change, when we look at the impact on water usage and water pollution, that arises from uh, expansion of corn production for uh, biofuels. When we look at the amount of local uh, air pollution with respect to uh, health impacts and so on, um, when we look at the impact of forests which are being destroyed to expand biofuel plantations, and when we look at the impact on uh, food prices from the increase and competition between uh, food for fuel as opposed to food for people, uh, as well as looking at the impact on uh, poor farmers, the use of marginal lands, and the impact on indigenous peoples, uh, all of whom are affected by this worldwide expansion of biofuels, we find that there are serious areas, uh, serious problems in each of these areas. And it's very hard to uh, not conclude that the only reason why biofuels are being pursued so energetically is because large corporations have been very successful in lobbying governments to provide enormous amounts of subsidies in the, million, in the billions of dollars annually. The alternatives that I think uh, need to be looked at are certainly not fossil fuels. Uh, we need to move away from fossil fuels, and, and that uh, should be stated very clearly and understood. We need to do that not only because of the impact on climate, but also because we are entering an age of energy descent where there's simply going to be less of those fossil fuels available. And the sooner we learn to live with less of them, uh, the better off and more successful uh, we'll, we will be. So the alternatives are, to biofuels are certainly not more petroleum-based uh, gasoline. 
we need to look at things like uh, Tad mentioned in terms of solar energy, but we also need to look at um, issues that, that don't evolve uh, uh, fuel uh, directly, but only indirectly in terms of more public transportation. We need to look at the way we're designing cities so that we do not have to move either people or goods over the enormous distances that we now take for granted because we have cheap energy available from fossil fuels. So the solutions are uh, profound in many ways, but they certainly do not include increased use of fossil fuels. And what he said, and I would like to stress that time is not on our side in the U.S., that Congress and media, that is you guys, need to start moving on and start thinking clearly what is it going to be here 10 years from now? Because I can assure you that things may not look very pretty here five, ten years from today. And this is not going to be uh, you know, our fault. It's not for our lack of trying to tell you that you should go beyond press releases from the Renewable Fuel Association and, and, or, or Cargill or, or Monsanto, but you also need to talk to other people. And in small, on a small scale, in groups of students, uh, you know, in groups of people you know, I, de I deal with, the general recognition that there is a very big problem with how our economy functions, how extremely inefficient it is, how our cities are built for the car, not for the people, how we cannot even dream of, of not driving in our cars because there's no public transportation. Uh, this, just to begin to change this, will take decades. And we do not have decades. We have maybe 10, 15 years. 15 years from now, uh, conventional petroleum production will be declining by about 7% per year. And I know this because I am a petroleum engineer. Okay, Jack Santa Barbara, who which corporations are the main beneficiaries? Well, the, the, the very largest, uh, ADM, Archer, Daniels, Midland, uh, U.S. Bioenergy Corp., and Verison Energy are, have all been major recipients of subsidies. Um, the top 10% of the core subsidy recipients okay, were paid uh, almost 70% of the, of the subsidies. So that gives you an idea of uh, you know, how, the, how it's imbalanced in terms of the small farmer. Very good. Okay. This, this is the VTEC, uh, uh, the, the tax for ethanol blenders. These are uh, various tax credits for small ethanol producers, uh, various uh, uh, sub-market rate loans which are not taxed. If you do a more sophisticated analysis which was done uh, in Europe um, uh, by, by an outfit which is in Switzerland, um, you, uh, these, these subsidies amount to about seven to eight billion dollars per year. In Europe or in the U.S.? No, here, in the U.S., yes, mm -hmm. yes. Yeah, the, the equivalent uh, in subsidies amounts to about seven dollars per gallon of ethanol, yeah. something in that range. Yeah, so, so these are very significant subsidies, and, and again, uh, I would submit to you that the farmer directly benefits from a tiny, tiny fraction of these subsidies. So all this talk, uh, how are we helping the, the small farmer, is just that, talk. Back to the International Forum on Globalization, then I'll give you both a question, which is one of the problems that we see is this um, the, the looking for a quick technical fix, yes. that that is the easy way out without questioning the tremendous focus on the production end yes. of the uh, cycle here. So that in the, what I think one of the media representatives asked, how are you faring in the media debate? And one of the places we're losing is the idea that don't worry, we can solve greenhouse gases, you don't have to change your lifestyle, you don't have to think about what you're consuming, change a few light bulbs, we'll change to ethanol, it's all going to be good. Mm -hmm. And yet the, the reality is that we need to be looking at the uh, consumption side of the equation. You touched on that a little bit in, in where you began about uh, public transit and options, but it's beyond that, if uh, per capita uh, emissions, average per capita per American right now is 20 tons of carbon per year, uh, whereas in the developing world it's one to two, and in Europe you're already down to nine. So what, changing that message, and I think that's the hard message to get across, yes. the challenge. So in terms of this report and where you see the movement going, how to change the message on a mass scale where Americans in particular, start, and the rest of the world which will potentially follow suit, look at, okay, 
It's not just changing a source of fuel, it's changing a whole way that we're living. Where, where do you see this going 